Our next speaker is from a company called Green Citizen. And I got to know him when I watched this film called Racing to Zero. And I watched the film at the Wild and Scenic Film Festival of Nevada City. It's a citizens group for the South Yuba River. So it's South Yuba River Citizen League, or CIRCLE. And they have been holding this film festival for 14 years. It's really cool. And I go there to screen films for my class. And uh, one of the films that I saw was Racing to Zero, which was not yet available on DVDs. But there was this very articulate business entrepreneur who was living out every single ethics that I could possibly think of and doing it oftentimes at significant sacrifice to himself. So he's going to tell you about his business, but he's also going to tell you about the vision, and it's the vision that I think we can all buy into. So I welcome Mr. James Cow. It's nice to be here. Uh, I remember 15 years ago, one night I was sitting at home on Friday night with my wife, my two young daughters, who were flipping channels, and we saw a PBS program from Bill Moyle and the documentary about all these electronics that's illegally dumped globally in China in a village called uh, Qiwei, where there's no clean water. If you want a clean water, you will have to have a ship from 50 miles away. So imagine, we're in San Jose. How would you like to have your water ship from San Francisco? How many people can we afford it? So let me roll the clock backwards. Before watching that documentary, I actually was trained as a computer science uh, engineer from UCLA. I came here, worked for Hewlett Packard, and have already done several startup companies, like many of the engineers today in the dot-com 3.0. So I have a lot of experience in the high-tech industry, yet I didn't know there's a dumping crisis. So since Earth Day 2005, that I decided to develop a solutions and hope to address this global problem, piloting this in San Francisco Bay Area first. So the talk is about how to develop a zero waste electronic recycling systems. As you probably have seen in 60 minutes or in some documentaries, a lot of electronic, when it's not recycled properly, is shipped overseas to China, to India, Africa, anywhere they can find cheap labor uh, regulation and dump it there. You see the worker who are stripping the coppers, burning the copper, try to get uh, the, the, the insulation, try to get the housing to get the copper to it. Or they put an acid bath to try to liberate the co uh, uh, gold from the device. And it's done in a way that's polluting the environment, harming the person who's doing the work, and also all the riverbed and, and uh, soil around the areas. So, as you know, that computer has a lot of electronics, uh, has a lot of electronics, have a lot of toxin in there. There's mercury in your scanner, your printer, your copier. Uh, there's lead in the CRT monitors. All these are very damaging to the nerve system for our human bodies. And the brown lighted frame retardants is to protect us from burning the plastics is very, very a toxin and it will lock in your body and would, would be difficult to do. So this is actually uh, what we are seeing, what I'm experiencing the last 12 years to try to develop this system and we don't have a good system in place today. The problem that we don't have a good system today is because when we purchase electronics, the cost of recycling is not built in. You know, as the company that we use, the Apple, the HP, the Samsung, the LGs, when they sell us a product, they are too busy competing with the competitors and they don't build in the cost of recycling. And the retailers such as the Best Buy, the Amazon of the world, they also do not have the obligation to do that. As a result, that at some times the cost is not really coverable. For example, I'll give you a real life example. In January this year, the port of Oakland had a strike. All the West Coast had a strike. 
as a result, there's no shipping container can go out. Once the electronic is stripped down and crushed down, and the material need to go back to the source to get manufacture another new product coming over. As a result, all the commodity price has dropped. The metal price used to be eight cents a pound is down to two cents a pound. The plastics, which are housing all the electronics, used to be free to recycle. Now is 25 cents negative that I have to pay the vendor to do. So as a result, the commodity price, which used to be very high, which allow us to retrieve enough revenue to cover for the recycling cost, no longer is possible. So the, the cost, once the cost is not built in, the conventional system today in the world is that there should be some value in the used electronic. So you should be able to make the profit from that to cover for the recycling of that. And the truth of the matter is that that's not. In fact, a real system shouldn't have to depend on the fluctuation of commodity price. Uh, consumer, when we're paying to the electronics, we're not paying the full price. We'd be just paying for the production of the equipment, but not all the environmental costs go with that. So this is the, the PBS board I talked to you about that actually uh, motivated me to look into these problems. And I actually traveling around the world for two years in 2002 to 2004, and I realized that it doesn't matter if it's in Europe, in Asia, or in America, that recycling is an afterthought. Uh, the system is not developed to a way that actually solves these problems. So, electronic that are cost neutral, what I mean cost neutral is that it can generate enough revenue to cover its cost of recycling are these type of electronic. The desktop, the laptop, the, uh, you know, the, the router, and so on and so forth. However, you will be surprised to know what are the items that are costly to do. These are the type of items which actually cost money to do. Your innocent all-in-one printers that you actually print your report and submit it to your professor. I don't know if you still do that today. Maybe you just submit it online. You no longer need a printer. But there's a mercury ball inside. It doesn't matter how automated the recycling process take. Somebody have to painstakingly take it apart. So the cost of labor is tremendous. The refrigerator, which free on on there, which we need to be taken apart. So all these units actually if you really average out, the cost of recycling is actually about 50 cents a pound. That's in the current cost. Um, a few years from now, it might be at a dollar a pound, and this is never built in. Imagine the day that this price is built in, then we would have addressed these problems. Uh, and uh, with what's happening in the poor closing, the commodity price drops, there's a lot more dumping that's happening because a lot of recycling do not have their budget to cover for the cost of those low value items. So they have to find some way to export it to a developing country under a false name, reuse, which the item is not ever reusable. So uh, what we try to do as a company is we try to figure out how to uh, create enough revenue from the material we get. So 70% of Dismantle and demanufacturers, we actually item coming in, dismantle and demantle. 70% of the unit or 90% of the weight. You think about that. 90% of your electronic, our electronics, have no value. Those really need to have to be recycled properly. And to tell you how difficult it is to recycle, do you know how many different kind of sort take to really get the material properly for mass demanufacturing, 50 different sorts. From plastic, the different kind of LCD, to different kind of IC board, to different kind of uh, toner, you know, devices. 50 different kind of sort in order to get it to the stage actually is clean enough to remake and crush down for another material out of it. Um, what we have done as a company, because this is a very expensive Silicon Valley here, so what we've done is we have an incredible team of technicians who actually uh, break down the equipment, uh, take out the units that still have useful parts, and then sell it on eBay and Amazon. We use the revenue we generate from there to subsidize for the item that actually is a required cost. And at total, we were able to provide a free recycling service from here. But 
it would be much better this price is built in, so we can actually use the money to recycle these materials. So what Green Citizen has done is basically when I traveling around the world, look at these systems and look at us as individuals, the number one problem in lack of recycling is what? Lack of convenience, right? If you want to buy a phone or you want to buy a desktop or laptop, you go to your computer, you just buy from Amazon or walk down to your uh, Circuit City or Best Buy or whatever, then you, can, you have 50 different places you can. But when you come to recycling, how many places do you know you can recycle? Not many. So what we have innovated is this new approach by piloting retail stores that actually to do the recycling. What you're seeing on the left bottom side, that's our center in the San Rafael location. It's a beautiful looking center. You walk in, there's a museum which is set up with all the old electronics from old days and people come in and look at that first MacBook Pro or first, first uh, sewing machine from Singer Libresco, uh, Singer, uh, it's there. On the other wall, we have electronic recycle artwork from artists. And then it's a beautiful green center which are managed by an environmental science college graduate. So it's a totally different kind of experience you would have, think about recycling your bottle or anything like that. And we have five or six of these locations all throughout the Bay Area. And one of them is over at uh, San Francisco in a shopping mall. We're between a post office and Big Five. We're next on the same street down the road from uh, um, uh, Noah's Bagel. So it's a very popular mall that people go to. The concept here is in order for recycling to take off, it has to be convenient. It has to be convenient. And so this is what we're trying to pioneer. But we're facing a lot of difficulty. In the city of San Francisco, in spite of the fact we've been there for 10 years, the city planning department, when they heard about recycling the world, they say, well, you can't, do, you can't open a recycling center in retail. So we have to go through a very cumbersome bureaucratic process to show them this is actually what the society needs. So as an engineer by training, as a software engineer by training, I believe data recycling shouldn't be just an e-waste. It's an evidence recycling. So we collect the information, the so-called big data today. We can tell you how many HP printer, how many IBM uh, is doing, is we're collecting. The whole idea is that we want to use this data to coerce the manufacturer to do their part to recycling. So when all of us go and buy the equipment in the future, we can always vote without dollar for the manufacturer which are doing the best for the environment. Uh, in conclusion, I think this is a shared responsibility. It cannot. Manufacturer who make a lot of profit from selling us equipment, they cannot run away from being quiet not address this problem. Retailer, which are selling us equipment, they are logically convenient place to take back this equipment from us. Imagine that if you bought stuff from Best Buy, and the next time that you can go back there and just return the old printer you bought there, and therefore you can buy another piece of equipment, and they're able to show us as a society they're actually doing their parts. So I would like to ask for your help to think about any other solution that you might have uh, that actually to address the problem. But really, it's absolutely necessary for every metropolitan area to have this kind of system, as well as manufacturers need to get involved in solving this problem with us together. So, thank you for your time.